Hey guys, just a quick note before we begin this week's episode. This week I just happened to be sent a couple of pretty heavy-handed stories. I would like to issue a warning before we begin. One of our stories this week discusses sexual assault, and the other has actual descriptions of suicide and child death. Please listen at your own discretion. And if this is a little too much for you this week, I totally understand. And I've got another surprise for you next week some bonus content. So we'll see you then. And thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. How's your week been? I know a lot of my fellow Americans are gearing up to celebrate Thanksgiving, thus kicking off the holiday season here. I know the holidays can be stressful, whether it's because your family isn't exactly a Norman Rockwell painting, or because you're stuck at work or far away and are feeling lonely. Just know, I understand, and I hope that my hour of scares once a week will help you with a little escapism from the winter blues. A little housekeeping before we begin with our stories tonight. I was asked to be a guest on one of my favorite podcasts, How Are You Holding Up? You've probably heard me play their trailer at the end of this show every once in a while. I highly recommend it. For this week's episode, they had me on to discuss fear. So check it out if you have a chance. I also uploaded a new episode to my Patreon, available only to my patrons. It's a casual reading of The Lady of Sanix by Arthur Conan Doyle, a surprisingly gruesome story. I have a surprise in store for you all next week. I've teamed up with someone who will remain secret until then, and you'll be getting some bonus content. Look out for it on November 27th. Now, first up tonight, we have a story from Jeremy Schaefer. Jeremy wrote the absolutely bone-chilling story to whom it may concern in episode 12, Curiouser and Curiouser. He's back with a story that makes me think of Black Mirror meets The Lady in Black. Here is, but you said you loved me, she said. He spreads my legs so I can stand up straight. He's never done this before and he's drunk and inexperienced. He fumbles a bit and drops plenty of colorful language before getting it right. When he finally figures out how to turn me on, I get a chance to look at the room, to appreciate more than just his bungling hands groping and pawing at me. I've never seen this room before. It isn't the excessively neat little office I'm used to. The kind of neat that's meant to cover up something foul. No, this hole is a mess. More suited to a pack of wild animals than human habitation. Thanks to the empty bottles, overflowing ashtrays, days old and rancid takeout boxes. The bed sheets hang half off the bed, and that's just what I can see since I'm not able to turn and look about on my own. I can see only what I'm directed to see. As bad as the room is, one look at him is all it takes to be happy. I can only see and hear. I believe a lack of smell, taste, or touch is one of those blessings, the other guy, the one I'm usually used by, is always talking about. Still, I remember everything people want me to, and if he wants, I'll remember these sights and sounds, so my luck isn't that great. Oh well, who am I to judge? Besides, I believe I have been made to forget worse by the other guy. 
again. Who am I to judge? He plops down on an old chair that threatens to break or fall back under his sudden weight. He doesn't seem to notice and only takes a drink from a bottle before lighting up a cigarette. He stares at me for a long moment, unspeaking and unmoving, save to take a drag of his smoke or swig of booze. He isn't unfamiliar to me, though any time he happened to be in my view has been erased by the other man. I haven't seen this one in a while. Before he was fresh-faced, clean-shaven, and handsome. Now he's haggard and defeated, though something tells me it hasn't been that long since he was more like I last saw him. He finally takes a package of recording tapes out of my carry bag and rips it open. He blunders around for several minutes, trying to get the tape and write with his muddling, inebriated hands. There are, again, more than a few swear words involved. Eventually, he makes me remember what comes next. Despite this, it still takes a few minutes before he does anything other than blankly stare at me. Admittedly, he does draw from his cigarette, downs a few gulps from his bottle, but I don't count that as actually doing anything. I remember all the same. Finally, he starts to speak. I'm not sure how it happened in the first place. I think it might have been Marshall. No, maybe it was... He stops, thinks about it. Yeah, Marshall. He was always the one who could get us to go along with these fucked up ideas and stuff. Another long pull from the bottle, and... You see, we could do almost anything and get away with it. Fuck if anyone was going to say anything. And if they did, well, our dads took care of it. They always took care of it, and there was nothing anyone could say or do to them. (laughs) Our dads, man. He laughs slightly and moves to snuff out the cigarette. He isn't paying any attention to what he's doing. Keeps his eyes on me instead and misses the ashtray by several inches, mashing the butt hard into the table. They're pillars of the community and stuff, you know. Yeah, I guess it's only right that five pieces of puffed up shit like them would be holding up a community like Millhaven. He drinks a bit more and lights another cigarette. So yeah, the five of us could do whatever the fuck we wanted. (laughs) No one could do a fucking thing about it. Our dads would all be pissed and yelling. They'd beat the shit out of us sometimes. But they never stopped us. Not in any real way. They could have, you know? Hell, more than us, they could have done anything they wanted. Fuck. If they wanted, they could have dragged us out to Mill Square and stoned us to death in front of everybody. Gun us down or take an axe and chop off our heads. Whatever they wanted. And no one would make a single peep. He tries to laugh again, but ends up in a coughing fit. Once he catches his breath again, he clears his throat and takes a swallow from the bottle to help. Another sadder chuckle escapes him. Kill us right there in front of that statue of Old Man Mills. I bet that sick fuck would be rotting up in his crypt with a mean heart on over that shit, man. He snorted out a small laugh before calming down. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about any of that shit. Not all mills or the chicken shit people of this town or our fucking dads. 
I'm here to talk about her. Talk about Amy. He might have wiped a tear away from his eye or just rubbed some sleep out of it. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. She was one of those girls who, you know, shouldn't have been pretty, but they were. I mean, she was kind of dumpy or frumpy, or, well, she wasn't, she just looked like she was, see? She was always wearing clothes, like, two sizes too big and mostly black. I think she got him over at those thrift stores up on the highway. He sneered for emphasis as he took a drag from his cigarette. For starters, she was from the brickyard, so, you know. She was poor and probably Catholic, but I don't think she went to church or anything. She listened to all this fucked up music, like, Susie Sue with the Banshees or something? And Nick Cave? Nick Cage? Man, I didn't even know he sang. After meditating on that for nearly a minute, he jumped a little from his chair. Oh, and she was always reading those books about vampires and ghosts and witches and shit. I mean, she wore black lipstick. His case, apparently made and iron-clad, he fell back to his drunken slouch. I mean, she shouldn't have been pretty, but she was. You know, in here, he says, lazily patting his chest. A shrug was thrown in for good measure and he may have sobered up some on that one. If Marshall had left us alone that night, me and Amy could have... A scowl washes over his face. I'd have lived pretty fucking happy with that. He angrily mumbles. She shook me up, man. He declared suddenly and loudly, after another moment of blank silence. Made me see that... I'd never done anything for myself. I'd probably be in some Bible college, learning to be a preacher, just like my old man. I never wanted that. He did, but not me. But that's what I'd be doing now. I'd also be married to some bitch who wears the right color lipstick and yellow sundresses in the summer with pastel open-toed shoes or some shit. She'd have brunch with her friends all the time and throw garden parties and maybe take up playing bridge on Wednesday afternoons. She'd tell everyone that sex is only for procreation while she'd be a total freak every night in her bedroom. Somehow she'd keep her figure and perfect tits and perfect ass even after pumping out three or four or five kids. I don't know how she'd do it. But she would, because that's what the kind of girl I would have been married to would have been like if I hadn't. His words fall away in a hazy thought, a second. If I hadn't figured out Amy was pretty when she wasn't supposed to be. He regretfully sighed. Turning the bottle up, the final drop fell into his waiting mouth. Casually letting it drop to the floor, he lurched out of view, only to come back a few seconds later with a new bottle. He wrenched the cap off, carelessly tossing it off to the side as he plopped back onto the chair. A little of the whiskey spilled out onto his bare stomach, but he didn't notice. He just lit a new cigarette as he started talking again. So how did it start? He leaned back in the chair, looking up at the ceiling and points upward. 
You really got a sick sense of humor, fucker. He yells at no one. I think that's what he said and did. I don't really notice. I feel a bit queasy for a moment and zone out some. It was a few months before the end of my senior year in high school. Things were going well, I had my friends, I was banging the hottest girl in the school, and I could do whatever I wanted. I guess the only downer was my dad. He's the preacher at the church. The real one, not the Catholic one. And he wanted me to be one too. I didn't want that. I mean, I saw the pool he had around here, and I kind of wanted that, but being a preacher... I really didn't even know if I believed in all that Jesus shit anyway, and I told him as much. We got into a fight about it. We had a hundred times before, but this was worse. Way worse. Got more than a little physical. Not that it never did before, it was just the first time I was Big enough to give the old man as good as I got. Even more, it turned out. He adds with a prideful smirk. I left for a few hours so things could cool off at home and ended up at the truck stop out on the highway. I didn't know Amy was working there at night. He shakes his head in disbelief. The idea that people actually worked well in high school... I had heard about it, but I didn't think anyone, you know, really did. I mean, I thought that was just shit they did in the movies. That's the thing with me back then. Things just didn't seem real unless they happened to me directly. I mean, I knew they were, but I never thought about it. That was something Amy changed about me. I'd known her since preschool, but that night I realized we had never said more than two words to each other. She was standoffish at first. I can't blame her. Hadn't been the best people to her over the years. Then she saw the bruise on my jaw, I guess. She understood. I mean, the other guys got it at home too. Knew what it was like, but... If I ever said anything, I just got ragged for being a pussy. But Amy, I didn't have to say anything. She just got it. I wasn't busy in the diner that night, so she and I talked for most of her shift. My dad was pissed when I got home, but he left me alone. I didn't care. For the first time in my life, I had someone I could talk to who would really listen. I ended up going back to the diner a lot. If she was working, I was there, talking her ear off. She called me out on that real quick. She said she wasn't a therapist. I didn't really know what to do with that. No one ever called me out on any of my bullshit before. Not in a way that mattered. I stayed away for a few nights, then I went back and apologized. After she got off work, I gave her a lift home and We talked about what she had going on. It was the first time I ever really listened to someone else. You know, for real listened. Not just sit there nodding my head until they shut up and I could talk again. Anyway, after that, Amy seemed pleased to see me when I dropped by. We started talking away from the diner, too. We'd see each other in the hallway and just say hi or... If no one was around, share a joke or something. She'd call me, or I'd call her, and we'd talk most of the night. I stopped hanging out with my friends outside of school, and the off chance I could do something with Amy. More whiskey disappears, and another cigarette is lit. No one knew what was going on. Not at first, but it wasn't long before my girlfriend, Lindsay, figured a little out. She got pissed, gave me the it's her or me thing, even though she didn't know who the her was. It surprised me how easy the choice was. Lindsay was not pleased. 
He snickered as he pours more whiskey down his throat. As pissed as Lindsay was, I didn't hold the candle to my dad. He was fucking livid. Yeah, he thought Lindsay was shallow, moronic, and vapid, and fuck if he didn't peg her true, but the thought that of every female over the age of, like, eight... In his mind, Lindsay was the perfect preacher's wife. Never mind what that said about my mom. She was who I was supposed to marry. Hell, the whole reason I went out with her in the first place was because my dad told me I had to. I didn't put up much of a fight about it. She was hot. I was 15 and horny. That was enough for me. Over the next couple of years, though... He looks off into the distance shaking his head slightly. (sighs) Listening to Lindsay talk about... Fuck, if I even know what she used to talk about. The thing is, Lindsay could talk and talk and talk and never say a goddamn thing. It was always about what this person said or what this person wore or to make up fun of someone. None of it ever amounted to shit. I guess it was good she never shut up because I never had anything to say to her anyway. So my dad asked who I was seeing instead. Who could be better than Lindsay? Amy and I wasn't dating or anything then, so I told him I wasn't seeing anyone. Dad didn't buy that. Once we did the whole dance about whether I was gay or not, He demanded I bring this new girl over to meet him. I told Amy. She was well aware of my dad. From me and his reputation. And the thought of it scared the shit out of her, but she agreed anyway. We didn't even get to one of Dad's long-winded graces before he threw her out of the house. I tried going with her to... At least drive her home, but Dad kept me home. He didn't care that Amy would have to walk more than ten miles, mostly in the dark. Said it'd be for the best if something happened to her out there. He yelled for an hour about Satan leading me away from the right path. How everyone from Brickyard was sinful. Blah, blah, blah. I apologized to her first thing the next day even though she said I didn't have to that was the first time I told her I was in love with her we never went out on a date we hadn't even kissed but I had fallen for her all the same she tried to tell me I wasn't that I just found someone who would let me be me for once. Still, she liked me back. And we ended up kissing. He popped up from his seat and walked away. I can hear him taking a leak. Given the state of the room, I guess I should feel thankful he went in the toilet. The room starts to spin. I feel my vision roll upwards, too fast to catch anything. It slows down, not sure after how long, and I find he's returned. He's just sitting there once more. There's already one lit cigarette hanging from the edge of the ashtray, but he lights another one anyway. When he notices, he let out a huffing little giggle and puts the old one out. So, Marshall finds out about Amy. I already knew something happened between the two of them in like eighth grade or something. I don't know what, but it was something. She never said what. Started to once, but didn't. I didn't want to push her. I could have asked him. I'm sure he would have told me, just as I'm sure it had been complete bullshit. 
whatever it was, he'd just say she was a bitch and leave it at that. Even without asking me about it, he had plenty to say about her. Every chance he got, he'd dog Amy out to me. He sits up straighter, his face going sour, and he points two fingers at me. He'd say, Getting your dick wet with fat-ass brickyard bitches. I get it, son, but you fuck them and you forget them. You don't bring them home to meet the folks. He imitated in a deep, mocking voice. That's what he'd say, you know. If he was being decent, he was hardly ever decent. Mostly, he just told me he thought I was stupid crazy for having anything to do with her at all. He'd say that kind of shit about Amy whenever she wasn't around, but the few times she hung out with me and my friends. Marshall would look at her real weird like. He'd get quiet and just look at her like. He screws his face up a few times. I think he's attempting to emulate this look, but I could be wrong. After all, it could be he just realized how awful it must stink in his room. I didn't notice it until our buddy Mike said something about it. After that, I saw it all the time. I thought about asking her what went on between them, but... He took several more pulls from his bottle as the thought drifts away from him. He reaches out and makes me stop remembering. He never leaves the chair, just hunches over and cries for almost an hour. When he finishes, he breathes sharply and wipes the tears and snot and slobber away with an old shirt. Then he makes me remember again. And things go wonky. An old memory flashes by. I'm not sure how. This is a new tape. His face is leaning in close. Taking up most of my vision. It's like his face, but older. Harder. Contemptuous. The wages of sin is death. He sneers, drawing out the word death for a long while as if it proves his point. He follows it with an assured visage, spoiled by a grin that's a bit too giddy at the prospects. No, it's not my place to judge. I'm usually more professional than this, but I'm having some personal issues. My own thoughts shouldn't drift off like this, especially on something that shouldn't be on a new tape. Something I'm not sure ever happened for me to remember. I snap out of it and do my job. I told Marshall I didn't care what he thought. He's saying when I tune back in. His face and voice are rough with old anger. I told him they could all fuck off. Mike and Josh said they were sorry for what they said pretty quick. Marshall did his usual shit when he pissed me off, waited a few days, then made amends when it made me look like the asshole if I didn't forgive him. I did, like I always did. Don't know why, I knew it was bullshit like always. Paul never said anything about it. He just fell back in as if it never happened. Marshall was happy, the crew was back together. I thought it didn't really matter. I only had a couple more months until we graduated. We are going to go our separate ways and I'd never have to see any of them again. I enrolled into a seminary out of state, one my dad liked. 
I thought I could do that until I figured out what I wanted to do and Amy could go with me. She didn't have plans for college and her parents were doped out assholes, so what did it matter if she was here or somewhere else? If we were together, I knew it would all work out. I could let Marshall and the others think we were all cool until then. I could last that long. Another cigarette is lit. He downs the rest of his bottle. I can tell he's thinking about getting another for a long while before he looks back at me. Still. I kept thinking about all our time growing up. It hurt thinking about losing all that. I think that's why I let Marshall talk. Oh, the room needs to stop spinning. I have a job to do and this isn't helping. Lindsay and the pack of wolves she called friends made shitty comments all night after that. Marshall and the others weren't there and that worried me a bit. Hardly anyone talked to Amy or me, but we didn't care. Besides, we didn't stay long. We ditched the prom and went to Mills Lake. The community center there was being renovated and it was all closed off, so no one would be there. We'd be alone. We were there for, fuck, it must have been hours. I knew, I think we both knew, you know, without saying anything, what that night was supposed to be, what we were going to do. It didn't turn out that way, though. It turned out way wrong. Marshall and the others showed up. They'd been drinking. Just drunk enough to be stupid, but sober enough to not mess it up. He stops again. He makes several attempts to talk again, but can't or won't. Finally, it all comes out so fast. Huge sobs racking his body, and I can't understand what he says. It's just all so garbled. I have no way of letting him know any of this. I can only watch, listen, and remember as well as I can. I can't even hope whoever watches this later can make any sense of it. He settles down takes huge breaths and wipes his snotty nose. I stood by and I watched it all happen. I don't know why. I don't know why I kept giving Marshall so much power over me. Why? Why I let him... Why I went along with it. Amy was laid out over the table. She'd stopped putting up a fight by then. It stopped moving at all. When I was finished, she just mumbled something. Kept repeating it. I've tried to pretend I didn't hear her. Tried to pretend all this time, but I... I heard her. I know what she said. He doesn't say what she said. He cries a little more instead. The others... Celebrated behind me. Well, Marshall and Paul did. Mike and Josh just drank more, tried to forget what they did, I guess. Marshall came up to me, hollering. I was about to knock the shit out of him when Paul started yelling, just screaming and cussing. We looked back, and Paul was holding his eye, and Amy was running away. Marshall took off after her. I did too, but to stop him. 
until you disappeared around a corner and I heard her scream. I got there, found, I found Amy on the ground and Marshall standing over, she was still and he had a, he had a brick in his hand. I tried to get her to speak, to move, to do something. There's so much blood. I knew, but I didn't want to admit it to myself. I think it was Josh's idea to put her in the lake. Like she drowned. Him and Marshall put a bunch of the beer cans around where they put her in, I guess to give the idea she'd been drinking a lot or something. Paul and Mike helped. They looked like a bunch of dumbasses trying to cover it up. I let them know. I hope I hoped we'd we'd get caught. Finally get what we deserve. He whispers softly. He closes his eyes. They stay shut for so long, I think. He might have fallen asleep. But his eyes pop open wide. He sits a bit straighter and begins talking once more. But our dads are the pillars of the community of Millhaven. Because of that, the five of us could always get away with anything. Anything. Amy was a girl from the brickyard, so in everybody's mind she was bound to end up like that anyway. Rape? The girl from the brickyard? What we boys did to, with her was sinful, but it wasn't rape. You can't rape a girl from Brickyard since they're all sluts and whores. Murder. What did she have to live for? She probably had a moment of honest reflection and saw no point going on. Sure, it looked bad, but us boys were just victims of bad timing. It wasn't murder. It's obvious she got drunk and drowned in the lake. That's... What our fathers told them. Townspeople probably knew better. Or maybe they didn't. If they're not stupid enough to fall for that bullshit, they're petty enough not to care. Our dads knew better, though. We never saw the inside of a jail cell, not for a second. All we got was a serious beating out of it from our dear old dads. Still, we graduated high school with no problems and went to college. That was six years ago. We never saw each other again, not until last week. He goes quiet and his eyes narrow in suspicion. He flies from his chair and leaves my sight. Mostly, anyway. I think he's looking out the window. He comes back a moment later, still carefully watching something just out of my view. I have to be quick. I don't have much time. Paul's and Mike's fathers were found dead. Paul's dad was the sheriff and Mike's the local magistrate. Their bodies were found in the judge's chambers. They couldn't figure out how or why they died. They just dropped in the same place in time. That brought the five of us back for the funerals. The day after the funeral, Paul was found out by the highway. I guess he'd gone up to the strip joint. His car was on the side of the road. We all thought he was just drunk and ran off the road and slammed into a tree. Then 
Mike mentioned Paul was missing an eye. Like it had been plucked right out of his skull. Josh was next. His mom found him when she heard water running. It was flowing from the bathroom and out into the hallway. He was in the tub. Drowned. The tile at the edges were all cracked and bloody. They said that there were bits of fingernails in the tiles like he'd been trying to climb out, but he couldn't. Then Marshall and his dad were killed. Heads bashed in with a brick. They were such bloody messes, it was almost impossible to tell them apart. Marshall's mom said she heard them in his dad's study. They started yelling, one of them trying to get out, but the door wouldn't open. She could hear the beating, could hear them scream while she tried to get the door open. She said it wouldn't budge. Then everything went quiet in the office. The door just opened after that. I'm doing my best to hang in here now, but I can't focus that well. It's all going flighty, and I can hear birds singing. They're not nice birds, either. The birds are angry. The birds are hungry. I can see the birds. I heard the gun go off. I ran into Mike's room as fast as I could. He was laying across the bed, brains on the sheets and wall behind him, pistol hanging from his fingertip. There was a note on his desk talking about that night and the guilt Mike carried over it. Something had been scrawled along the bottom of the note. It wasn't in Mike's handwriting. Don't let me stop you. That's what it said. That's what she wrote. I know it was her. I know her handwriting. That was four days ago. I didn't come here to hide. I've been doing that for six fucking years and I know I can't anymore. I took my dad's video recorder so I could let the world know what happened to me, what happened to us, why we deserved it for what we did to Amy. We deserved it and more. If I could go back and change things. The lights in the room flicker and die. I can hear the door to the room swing open. His face is of one resigned to his fate, yet could never imagine how terrible it would be. I'm sorry, Amy. He weakly sobs out as something roughly knocks me over to pull him down to the floor. I'm lying against the bed at an awkward angle. With the poor lighting, I can't really tell what's going on, but I can see someone over him. I think it's a woman. She speaks, but not in words. It's more like sharp stabbings in the ear at different angles and depth. He's still whimpering, still alive, when she begins to drag him away. As she does, she pauses to look directly at me and smiles. At least, I believe she smiles. I think it counts as a smile even if there are no lips. Then I'm left. 
left in the darkened room alone. I can tell when morning comes, since the room begins to lighten as the power in my battery dies and my sight starts to wink in and out. I start to think, I can see what he meant when he said she was pretty, but she shouldn't have been. Our last story of the night comes from Catherine Eddowes. Catherine also wrote the story from last week called The Man in the Long Black Coat. Many of you may know this already, but the 40th anniversary of the Jonestown Massacre, in which 900 members of the People's Temple cult, headed by Jim Jones, was this past Sunday on November 18th. If you're looking for a more in-depth look at Jim Jones and the entire tragic history of the People's Temple, I highly recommend the last podcast on the left series on Jonestown. Also, one note that I know some people will call me out for. Yes, I know it was flavor aid, but I wanted to stay true to the author's words. As a note, the author prefaces this story by saying, This is dedicated to the good people of the People's Temple, whose words have inspired this story. Here is, they took the babies first. Kathy looked at Jim Jones, and a black film covered her eyes as she felt the heat of Guyana fall away. A warm wind now swept through Jonestown. Then the rain started. Hot, tropical rain that boomed around the camp. Jim Jones's face was as heavy as those raindrops, and his eyes were milky clouds behind his dark glasses. People play games, friend. They lie. They lie. What can I do? He was speaking to the man from NBC. The man wearing denim. The man that would be dead before the day was out. Leave us, I just beg you. Jones's face was melty yellow and he slurred his words. Anybody who wants to leave can leave. People were leaving. The Parks family were walking too quickly to the congressman's truck. Patty Parks looked blanched with terror, holding tight to her daughter's hand, joined the other ten or so people leaving. With this suitcase-carrying line of defectors, Kathy felt the day change, rock back and forth on its axis, and threaten more than a storm. But the memory of last night's party bounced back into her head like an echo. The band had been ardent as they played and sang. The children's smiles were trusting, The adult smiles were crazy, seemingly eating the faces from their lips in words. Kathy had felt that same demented smile on her own face. It had seemed heavy and ethereal at the same time. The congressman's speech was cheerful, and the applause... Oh, the applause. It seemed to dissolve all the questions from the concerned relatives. But Jim had been twitchy even then, sitting drawn in and suspicious, even before the first note was passed. Now, 
Whole families were leaving. Not only the parks. Somewhere in Kathy's mind, there was a memory of her own family in Arizona. And the sound of her mother's voice on the last phone call. Did you get my rosary, hun? I sent it at Easter. What about coming home for Christmas, Kath, hun? Could you do that? We'd love to see you at Christmas Mass. Well, think about it, eh? And I love you, Kath. Remember that. I love you. That was in California. That was when the community had still been a church. Less talk of the CIA and spies and defectors and traitors. Kathy was watching the families, whole families, leaving, and was thinking about that sore, raw sound in her mother's voice that had seemed provincial at the time. Too Catholic, too working class, too far away. No chance of ever getting them to relocate as so many others had done. The middle class whites in the temple, the parks. She watched the suitcases swinging from Mr. Park's hand, polished brown in the Guyanese afternoon light. The light struggled against the laden clouds. And then, noise. Something was happening near Congressman Ryan, and shaky hands were pulling someone off of him. From where she was at the back of the pavilion, all Kathy saw was the blood smudging in and out on the congressman's white shirt, and she knew the day had fallen off the earth. It took her a second to realize the attack wasn't fatal. And for the briefest of moments, the day righted itself and north was north again. And south was south. He was not dead. It'll be okay. But then a woman in a red scarf was shouting. Kathy didn't know her. You bring those kids back here. You bring them back. The woman looked around widely, and her voice became hushed. They're taking my kids. No. And so the day fell out of the world again, and into the unknown darkness of the universe. Because Kathy remembered who Ryan was. A congressman. Somehow her legs took her further away from the pavilion and away from the scene. Her feet felt surreal and heavy and made her move, even though something in her still wanted to stay close to Jim, to father. His eyes behind the dark glasses looked frightened and lost, sensing defeat. Her feet propelled her watery legs on, nonetheless. Larry Layton was striding toward the pavilion with the usual look of devoted piety as he had worn since his sister had defected. It was as though he had taken the blame for her escape to Georgetown in the American embassy there as his own personal shame to carry. And of course, it was. Larry stopped at Kathy, and his eyes were trusting of her as they had always been. No doubt of her loyalty. No question. Go get a stethoscope from the medical bank. She didn't ask what for. She just moved but she moved slower than she might have previously. Moved slower than she meant to, and 
not in the right direction either. As she did, she heard Larry demand to go to the airstrip with the congressman. The congressman was leaving. Kathy buried a deep thought, deep down in her head. Larry won't defect. Can't. What's he doing? But she managed to bury the thought and the question far enough down and she was able to focus on her feet again. But why were they so slow? Her legs so hollow. And she wasn't at the medical unit either. Her feet had taken her legs to the bunkhouse. She slumped against the side and slid down it, squatting on the floor, feeling the rain on her face. She looked around. It was quiet here. Only Dawn and Alice Mason. They were huddled together outside the bunk Kathy shared with Alice. Ten other women and their children. The separation had been hard on Alice, and was one of the reasons she had complained and later in the pavilion had been humiliated and forced to confess the shortcoming. Kathy had watched as Alice was paddled by her own husband. It was good for Alice. It would help her adjust. The discussion that night had finished at 3.30 in the morning, and Kathy had felt tried and righteous when it finished, and proud, too, when Jim told her to take Alice for her public service. It'll be okay, Alice. You'll see, I promise. You'll be glad I told them. Alice had looked at Kathy as though she were from another world. Some alien race whose language Alice couldn't speak. Now Alice's pale blue eyes were sunken, and Kathy thought they had a ghostly look to them as she held their son, Brent, and looked up into Dawn's wide brown face. A face usually so pleasant and smiling. Alice's voice was filled with utter blackness. I think we're going to die here today. Don told Alice to be quiet. He whispered, You're scaring Brent. The baby gave a soft, muffled cry in his mother's arms his blue and yellow striped romper suit, pulling up at the back as he squirmed. Kathy looked away, but before she did, Alice caught her eye for a moment, a flickered moment that felt like it held everything in it, and with her gaze still oddly fixed on Kathy, Alice said to Dawn, We need to leave. The sound of the pavilion bell rang then. The sky shuddered, and Alice and Dawn took Brent and headed in the direction of the jungle. Jim's voice now. How very much I've tried my best to give you a good life, but in spite of all my trying, a handful of our people with their lies have made our lives impossible. We have have been been so so terribly terribly betrayed. betrayed. Kathy heard music from somewhere. The pavilion. Singing. Was it a record playing? Now, what's what's going going to happen happen here here in a matter of a few few minutes minutes is that that one of those people people on the plane plane is going going to shoot shoot the pilot, pilot, and down down comes comes that that plane plane into the jungle. jungle. Kathy saw Larry's high-foreheaded face looming into her vision. It was all coming to an end. She forced her legs up, and they seemed to have a new determination in them, and her feet felt less dense, more sure of themselves. She approached the pavilion again, and it swarmed with people, people who would soon lay strewn all over the brown earth. 
Kathy looked up at the pillars of the pavilion, pillars she had helped build, and they towered over her. But she now saw the cracks in the wood and saw that their support of the tin roof was precarious. So, so my, my opinion, opinion is, is that, that you, you be kind to children, children and, and be, be kind, kind to seniors and, and take, take the potion like they used to take in ancient Greece, and step over quietly. They won't leave us alone. Kathy couldn't move. Jim's nurse passed with Marceline Jones. Is there any way to make it less bitter? Is it quick? Yeah, it's supposed to be quick, the nurse said. Neither Marceline nor the nurse noticed Kathy, and Kathy stood and looked at the pillars. More of the inner circle swept past with the security team, the men carrying large metal vats. The men were all stern-looking, their eyes like dark mud. They were wearing guns, too, slung over their shoulders, and Kathy couldn't remember ever seeing guns before. The hulking tubs they carried gaped and gulped up at Kathy as they passed. Their swirling contents sloshed around in dense purple waves. Grape-flavored Kool-Aid. Kathy smelled bitter almonds. Is there any way to make it less bitter? Father's voice echoed round the pavilion. Don't, Don't be, be afraid, afraid to die. die. No, hell no. Christine Miller stood up and her strong, weathered eyes looked proud. In face of what she was about to say, Kathy thought her voice was too. Is it too late for Russia? Check with Russia to see if they'll take us immediately. Otherwise, we die. The crowd's applause was loud. I've been living on hope for a long time, Christine, and I appreciate you've always been a very good agitator. Christine didn't look around at anyone else. Didn't need approval. Just kept eye contact with Father, and Kathy suddenly wished she had spoken to Miller a bit more. Had gotten to know this fiery old woman when she had the chance, because... As Kathy was surly, sure, the chance was now gone. Well, I don't see it like that. I mean, I feel that as long as there's life, there's hope. That's my faith. And it wasn't when the first mother came forward to kill her baby that Kathy silently cried. It was then, looking at Christine Miller and listening to her words, Christine, who still wore her diamond earrings when everyone had sold theirs or given them over to the church, and Kathy suddenly understood why Jim had allowed Christine to do this. It made her unpopular. It made her, the voice of dissent, unpopular. We all came here for peace. I look around at the babies and I think they deserve to live, you know? And how her voice did falter. Just a little. Just a bit. Not so much as anyone else would notice. But Kathy noticed and she hated herself for being the only one there who did. The crowd rumbled, and it was beginning to sound like snarls. Miller said something. One last, small, sad thing that Kathy couldn't hear. But it was too late. Miller's voice was soon deadened in argument and applause, and in amongst it all, one of the camp trucks that Kathy hadn't noticed had left arrived back. More inner circle members jumped out and spoke quietly to Jim. 
The congressman is dead. Father's voice was flat and druggy. There was an uproar of voices, some cheering. You think think they'll they'll let us get away away with with this? this? You must must be be insane. insane. They'll They'll torture torture some some of your children children here. They'll They'll torture torture our our seniors. seniors. People were moving forward to the vats of purple swirl. The youngest of the children were carried up to the tables. Children who had been born here. Syringes were brought out. Kathy saw a mother squirt the liquid into her baby's mouth, then take it herself. Some of the older children started crying. Some were taken out of their mother's arms because their mothers couldn't do it. Hurry, Hurry, my my children, children, hurry. hurry. Die Die with with respect. respect. Die Die with with dignity. dignity. Don't Don't be be this way. way. Okay, it was happening. Okay, all the white night rehearsals were real. Kathy remembered the people's temple services as they had been. So loud and and so alive. Jim in the pulpit, sincere and truthful and full of answers. Suddenly, Kathy wanted the rosary her mother had sent her and she half stumbled back to her bunk. A little boy, Thurman, she thought his name was, toppled towards her. He was on his own, and Kathy wondered for a minute where his mother was. She lifted him and took him further from the pavilion. His mouth frothed and foamed, and eventually the cyanide endued the heart attack that would kill him. Thurman looked up at Kathy with wide, confused eyes. And she told him that he'd be okay, that his mother would be there soon. And the wild look in his eyes faded and he calmed for a moment. Kathy held him until she knew he was dead. She wiped the froth from his little mouth and lay him on the ground, closing his eyes. Jim's voice, again, continual. Hurry, hurry, hurry. She stood up and stumbled back to her bunkhouse, passing more mothers now crying over their children. The pavilion itself seemed to be crying, the very pillars weeping and moaning. A teenager wouldn't take the poison, and they tried again and again. She kept spitting it out. Finally, they held her and injected her. It wouldn't be long now till it was Kathy's own turn, but she wanted her rosary. She wanted something of her own mother with her when she did it. The bunkhouse was dark and quiet, and Kathy felt a peace settle inside her as she closed the door. She took out the rosary from her only drawer and wound it around her wrist. And the smooth red wood was comforting and normal. In the coolness of the post-storm bunkhouse, she had a sudden urge to lie down under the bed and hide. But she looked around and saw that someone had already thought of that before her. From under her own bed, she saw Hyacinth Thrash's purple dress, and kneeling down, her eyes met with Hyacinth's terrified ones behind their thick glasses. On seeing Kathy, Hyacinth covered her mouth to hide a scream. Kathy placed her hand on Hyacinth's, and the old woman reached out and touched the rosary. Kathy looked at the chain, one hand touching the smooth rosewood, the other hyacinth leather skin. Quickly, 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 the vat, the vat, the vat, vat, so the adults adults can begin. begin. Both women looked at the door. 
Kathy unwound the rosary from her wrist and placed it in Hyacinth's hands. Now the sound of gunshots made them jump. Kathy felt tears threaten again as she tucked Hyacinth's dress under the bed and pulled the sheet down. She crept out of the bunkhouse. As she came out, the security team, who had been at the airstrip, approached. Larry said, Where are you going, Kath? Back to the pavilion. His eyes were disbelieving now and paranoid like Jim's. You trying to escape? But before she could answer, he aimed his gun and fired. It clicked and nothing came out. Kathy couldn't move, just stared at the dark barrel and remembered her mother's last words. And I love you, Kath. Remember that. Larry didn't fiddle with the rifle, didn't look puzzled, just took it, swung it around, and hit her in the face with it. She felt the blood burst from her shattered nose before she fell to the ground. She lay there, and before her vision closed in on her, Kathy saw Mr. Muggs, the Jonestown chimpanzee mascot, shot in the back of the head. A patch of black-red fur spattered Kathy's face, and Jim's last words came through the loudspeaker. We committed an act of revolutionary suicide, protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. But Kathy didn't die. And when she woke to the hot afternoon sun, of Guyana, her eyes watered in the harsh glint. Blood had caked on her face, and she struggled to get up. With her struggle, there was a rush of surprised Guyanese voices, and figures in green military garb moved towards her. A doctor who had nothing else to do except give times of death now looked her over. A soldier asked her questions she couldn't answer. One of the Guyanese soldiers handed her a piece of paper. To whomever finds this, the story of the movement, this action, must be examined over and over. We did not want this kind of ending. If nobody understands, it matters not. I'm ready to die now. Kathy looked around and the bodies were like a human carpet on the dirt floor. Bright colors and denim jeans, bibs and braces, colorful headscarves. Most were face down. And so it was Brent's blue and yellow striped romper suit that she recognized. Alice and Don lay on either side of the little bloating body face down, and all three holding hands in a death daisy chain. And with the sight of that, Kathy fell to the ground again and cried and cried. The sound she made was something far away from her. She could only hear it vaguely. Then she felt kind arms around her, looked up and saw Hyacinth's own crying eyes behind the thick glasses. The old woman and the young held each other until their crying stopped. For now, later more tears would come. Many more over the years. The two women held hands as they walked around the compound under the mesmerized eyes of the soldiers, identifying bodies. At the press conference for the survivors, Kathy would tell anyone who'd listen that nobody sets out to join a cult, to join something they know is going to hurt them. Nobody intends to be a name 
on a long, sad list of dead, a grainy photo in a tabloid. Nobody wants to live as an ashen-faced survivor with a thousand-mile stare, scared and broken by their own naivety. Worse, nobody sets out to be a forever, don't drink the Kool-Aid joke. You set out to find a place you can belong. A place where you can be part of something bigger than yourself. To maybe change the world and the heartbreak of it is, for a time, you think you're doing it. And in the years that followed, when Kathy remembered the beginning of Jonestown and Guyana, she remembered how it had felt like heaven. She had seen Christ in Jim Jones. But November 17, 1978, would also come back to her. It would surprise her in a face at the grocery store, a baby striped romper suit, the rich red of her rosary hanging on the dresser, an old black woman in furs, or an echo in the voice of a cab driver. Then her heart would weep dark, sour tears, because with the end of Jonestown, she could no longer believe in heaven at all. Thanks for listening. I hope you take these two tales of how monstrous the world can be and go do something good this week. Whether it's sitting around a table with family or friends and telling them how thankful you are for them, giving back to your community, or maybe even giving back to yourself. Sometimes we forget that we ourselves could also use some love and care. I know one thing I'm thankful for, and that's all of you. My life has become so much happier since I began spreading thrills and chills and having these little weekly chats with you. I have one new Patreon patron to thank, and that is K.E. Thank you so much, and again, if you'd like to listen to my newest bonus episode, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash scare you to sleep. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at scare you to sleep. You can follow me personally on Instagram at Shelby B. Scott. Join the Facebook group. It's growing a little every day and it makes me so happy. Just search scare you to sleep. You can listen to my guest spot on how are you holding up on any podcast app. Give them some love too. Make sure to rate and review them on Apple Podcasts. I'll play their trailer at the end of this episode for you to get a refresher of what they're all about. I think that's all for me tonight, folks. Now, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams. Do you feel depressed and listless? Do you find social interactions exhausting or terrifying? Do you or someone you know have dark thoughts echo in your mind on a regular basis? Don't worry, we do too. I'm Chris. And I'm Lindsay, and we're the hosts of How Are You Holding Up? A podcast by the depressed, for the depressed. We aren't doctors, therapists, or anything of the sort. We just have depression and anxiety. And want to talk about it. So come and join us on a mental health adventure wherever you download your podcasts. And let us know, how how are are you holding up? up?